Welcome everybody to the Early Modern Global Caribbean, a Huntington Research Conference convened on our behalf by Professors Carla Pistana of UCLA and Molly Walsh of the University of Pittsburgh, who have been responsible for putting together this extraordinary roster of speakers. My name is Steve Hindle. I'm the WM Keck Foundation Director of Research here at the Huntington, where my duties uh, include the oversight of the uh, research program and especially the conferences. It's my pleasant duty to be your host and to thank and recognize those who've made this remarkable event possible. Most significantly, we at the Huntington would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water and air. Specifically the Tongva peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present and future. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on their homelands. More prosaically, to the extraordinary staff in the research division, my gratitude is due. To my assistant, Catherine Worry miller for all of her hard work on the brochure and liaising with the speakers. To Juan Gomez for his work on registrations and the distribution of the papers. And to our AV maestro, Ben Tuttle, for his management of the Zoom webinar format. This conference has been three years in the planning. Carla and Molly successfully applied to our conference sponsorship competition in December 2017. The program was originally conceived to take two days in situ in the Rothenberg Hall at the Huntington, but the present crisis has forced us to move it online to the Zoom webinar format. This is both a challenge and an opportunity. While there are technical limits to the number of people who we can have on screen to, at any one time, we are able to reach a much larger and more remote audience. I suspect that we would probably have had 60 to 80 attendees in Rothenberg Hall, but we have over 280 registrants for the program, and many of you are already online with us this morning. Many thanks to all of you for joining us from both sides of the Atlantic. The change of format means a slight change to the program. The speakers will give briefer presentations than would otherwise have been the case, and each will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, leaving time for 30 to 35 minutes of Q&A at the end of each panel. The speakers have generously agreed to pre-circulate their papers, which were made available to those of you who had registered by last Tuesday earlier in the week. Please respect their intellectual property and do not cite the papers without the author's express permission. But please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit questions. And of course, it would help us if you could be clear about to whom you would like your specific question addressed uh, when you submit your question. My final thanks are to Molly and to Carla, without whom none of this would have been possible. Let me introduce each of them and then invite first Molly and then Carla to make their introductory remarks. Carla Gardina Pastana is Professor and Joyce Appleby Endowed Chair of America in the World in the Department of History at UCLA. She holds her PhD from UCLA and is the author of Quakers and Baptists in Colonial Massachusetts, 1991, The English Atlantic in an Age of Revolution, 2004, Protestant Empire, Religion and the Making of the British Atlantic World, 2009, The English Conquest of Jamaica, Oliver Cromwell's Bid for Empire, 2017, and imminently, The World of Plymouth Plantation, forthcoming with Harvard next month in October, 2020, and uh, Carla has been proudly waving a copy of that volume around uh, this morning. Molly Walsh is Associate Professor in the Department of History at the University of Pittsburgh. She holds her PhD from Johns Hopkins and is the author of American Baroque, Pearls and the Nature of Empire, which appeared with UNC Press in 2018. Her next project is Servants of the Seasons, Itinerant Labor and Environmental Flux in historical perspective, a project that she hopes to be pursuing at the Huntington before too long. So let me reiterate my thanks to Carla and to Molly and to welcome Molly to make her opening remarks. 
Thank you. What I'd first like to say is a tremendous thanks to all of our panelists for somehow finding the time and the energy to do this work and have these conversations and be here today. I know that many people uh, participating today uh, on our panels and also in the audience are in very different time zones and juggling many difficult commitments in these extremely challenging days that we're living through. So Carla and I would like to extend our deepest thanks to all of you for your intellectual generosity and your flexibility with the new format. We would also like to thank everybody at the Huntington for hosting our conference and working around the clock to adapt the format to the current climate and to all of you attendees for joining us today. I also wanted to say a few words about why Carla and I wanted to facilitate this conversation about the early modern global Caribbean. Our shared interest in the region comes out of our sense that the Caribbean was in many ways the crucible in which many of the core elements of the modern world were forged. It was a place of tremendous violence and inequality of death and suffering, but also a place of tremendous cultural, intellectual, ecological and linguistic wealth and has continued to be so over the centuries. It is a place of endurance and creation as well as of destruction. We wanted to focus this conference on the pivotal early centuries in the post-1492 era when so much was in flux as a result of the momentous exchanges and struggles uh, and before a clear political, economic and demographic trajectory of the region was visible. In our view, as scholars who work on the region uh, in Atlantic and global context, much of the scholarship on the Caribbean continues to focus on the 18th and 19th centuries which are of course important and fascinating, but also more familiar. And we're interested in this earlier backstory and in particular in thinking about how the region in the 16th and 17th centuries was already shaping and shaped by global circulations of peoples, commodities, ideas, and more. Uh, I will leave my own brief comments there and let Carla say a few words before we turn to the first session. Um. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, you'll, you'll have seen perhaps that I also disappeared for a moment. I had a very nice office set up. I've been using it for about a week and five minutes into this conference, it wouldn't work. My internet wouldn't work. So I had to run upstairs <laughs> uh, where it seems to be better. I hope I can stay with you the whole time. And again, my apologies. This is such a, a Zoom 2020 moment for me. Um, so I wanted to thank a few people. Um, I want to thank all the attendees. I'm, I'm sad that we're not at the Huntington right now because I love the parts of conferences that happen outside of the podium spaces and the formal spaces. I love the conversations over coffee, et cetera, which we have to forego because of the pandemic. But the good thing about this is that so many people have been able to participate. Um, from around the world, and I think that's great. And so I wanna thank you all for finding time for our event in spite of all the crazy things that are going on in the world right now. Wildfires, state-sanctioned violence, pandemic, all the other issues. So thank you all for being here. I wanna thank the panelists who, in spite of, of dealing with all of these problems are, um, and also having childcare, elder care, inability to get to the archives have stuck with us and come to our event. So thank you all for being part of this community of early modern Caribbean scholars and for agreeing to participate in our, in our conference. Finally, also the, the Huntington. Um, Steve and his committee chose our panel, um, as he said, three years ago, and we were quite excited to be selected and to have this opportunity. So. To, the, to Steve and everyone else who's been involved in making this possible, my thanks. I just wanna say a, a, something about early modern um, because though I don't want anyone to ask me to define exactly what I mean about by that, I am the one who keeps putting that into the conversation because I'm really particularly interested in the early Caribbean. Um, when I got interested in the Caribbean about 20 years ago, uh, I found very little work on the 16th and 17th centuries. And uh, that was the period that I wanted to think about and learn more about. And so I have been doing what I can in my own work in the archives, but also in planning these kinds of events to get us talking about this very early period. There's a vast and wonderful and horrifying literature on, on the height of the plantation complex in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, slavery uh, and everything that goes along with that. There's a lot of interest in the Caribbean itself among the West Indian scho the scholars who work in the West Indies on the on the post-slavery and national periods of their various uh, 
uh, islands and nations. Uh, but this, the early period was at, at one time not considered to be very interesting. It had, you know, Columbus arrived and then, you know, pretty much it faded from view for a lot of us. So I've been interested in learning more about it and very happy over the last couple of decades to find more and more people that are also interested. Not only those who are here, but there's many other scholars we would have liked to have included in our program who are also interested in this early period. So I'm, I'm very glad that we're able to have this conversation about the early modern global Caribbean and that you can join us for it. So thank you all. Um, now I'll turn it over to Molly, who's going to chair the first session. Thank you so much. So we are excited to get going, and our first session today is called Geographies of Exchange. I'll introduce each speaker um, immediately prior to their talk. Our first speaker is David Wheat. David is an Associate Professor of History at Michigan State University. He is the author of Atlantic Africa and the Spanish Caribbean, 1570 to 1640, published in 2016 with the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture and the University of North Carolina Press. His paper today is titled, Catalina de los Santos, Caribbean Widow and Shipowner of African Descent in Terceira, Seville, Tenerife, and Havana. David, please. All right, thanks so much, Molly, for the nice um, introduction. Um, yeah, so I have just a few slides. This is going to be a very, um, quick uh, talk, um, and I hope that uh, uh, Ben will um, stop me if, uh, if anything goes wrong or I become, uh, uh, or if my sound uh, uh, fades out. Okay, so very quickly, um, because you've got the paper, if you wanna see some of the um, details. Um, so let me open here with this brief image of the um, port of Garachico, which was on the island of Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Um, it's one of several main ports in the Canaries during the period I've been looking at the 16th to 17th centuries that has a huge amount of uh, historical material, um, uh, primary sources, um, many of which um, have information for those of us who are interested in the Caribbean during the same period. Um, so I'm following the work of other uh, historians like uh, Elisa Torres Santana, who has a great book, History of the Atlantic, uh, which looks at um, you know, uh, this, a different island in the Canaries and, and some of the Greater Antilles. And I'm following the work of Arturo Sorregui, actually a Cuban historian who's done some, um, some provocative, uh, uh, a little bit of a provocative work too there. Um, so I'm not the first person to, to, to look at this. Um, so my topic here is this one interesting individual um, I stumbled on uh, in, the, um, in an archive in Tenerife, in the notarial archive there. Um, in La Laguna. And so this is an, an you know, the Spanish uh, source with a, my uh, transcription below. Um, what interested me about this person uh, was that uh, you know, she mentioned that uh, she described herself as being mulata in color um, and, and as a widow originally from Santo Domingo and what's today the Dominican Republic, right? Um, and that she um, and that she was the owner of her own ship. Uh, and she names the ship that was there in the port of Garachico in Tenerife. And so this was, you know, this really leapt out at me. Yes, I'm not used to seeing, um, I mean, I've never, I'm not aware of any other example of a free person of African descent appearing as the owner of their own transatlantic slaving, uh, I mean, sorry, not slaving, sorry, other type, transatlantic uh, vessel, right? The sailing across the, um, you know, different regions in the Atlantic Ocean. She also appears in the same document as a slave owner um, and as an employer of servants. And she also appears to have um, had a lot of connections with merchants based there in Tenerife, also in Seville and other places. I go into that in more detail in the uh, written version of the paper. So um, as you can see, she signs her name at the end. Um, I got to write a little bit about, and so this is the whole document, four pages. I, I wrote a, a preliminary analysis of this document um, that was published uh, last year. Um, and one thing uh, uh, that I was really surprised to see that her, you know, she had her nice name at the end. Um, so since I first found this one document, I found a number of other sources uh, where she also appears. She also, you know, has her name signed. And other documents where other people um, uh, yeah, cut deals with her, basically, right? Where they're, um, she's part of the of the um, of the record that's preserved. So so I have, you know between 10 and 15 uh, documents, most of which specifically mention her from there in Tenerife. Um, so based on the, on the documentation that I've been able to find in this one island in the Canary Islands in Tenerife, and one archive in Tenerife actually, um, I'm able to piece together other aspects of her life. And I don't know if you can see my little um, 
purple circles on this on this map uh, image here. This is very low tech uh, mapping, right? But I've I have her here, and uh, so she says she's from Santo Domingo. She appears in Teixeira in Azores. She definitely spent some time in Seville. Then she's in Tenerife. And then there's some hints that she may have gone afterwards to Havana, Cuba. Um, and so I can kind of uh, speculatively right, uh, uh, reconstruct some of her itineraries, though I, I would haste to mention that most of the time she's in this place is I don't know if she stayed there, if she's making additional trips. If she was in Seville for two years, she could have gone to a lot of places, done a lot of things. The same from, um, uh, uh, from Terceira or from um, Tenerife, actually. So um, uh, very, um, you know, conveniently, I've been able, now that I have a little bit more information about her, I can link uh, her and, the, and, the, and her ship, actually, to some voyages that appear in other studies, like the Shaw News, a famous uh, Seville and Atlantic, uh, which uh, Seville Atlantique, Atlantique, my French is not going to be so good on today's presentation, for which I apologize profusely. But uh, so, you know, I have here, the, you know, a screenshot of some pages where the same, some of the same people that appear in Tenerife notarial records um, uh, associated with her ship appear here. Um, so as it turns out, she sold the ship, as I mentioned in the paper, she sold the ship in Tenerife, um, ends up uh, possibly, uh, possibly double crossing one of her uh, merchant associates back in Seville. Um, and she gets away with the money. I mean, it's, she's really, she really does an impressive job of uh, uh, converting her debts into um, well, paying them off and converting sort of IOUs, that you think, monies that she's owed into cash um, or to future payments. Um, uh, so, so it's, she, she's, she's you know, pretty good at uh, uh, different types of negotiating uh, um, all sorts of transactions, um, some of which are very interesting. So what I've been doing lately is trying to track her down in Havana to see if she really did there. And as I mentioned in the, um, I mentioned in the written version of the paper very briefly, um, you know, I think, uh, I think she did. Uh, she appears in at least five uh, sacramental records uh, in, you know, recorded in Havana during the 1590s. The timeline overlaps really like, just perfectly. The amount of time she's in uh, uh, Tenerife, she disappears in Tenerife records as far as I can tell. And then suddenly a person of the same name appears in uh, Havana um, you know, just a few months later. So she looks like she, if it's the same person, then she remarried um, in, in Havana. Uh, she served as the godmother for, um, or the uh, owner of enslaved people who were godparents in several uh, baptisms also. Um, so uh, here's another uh, record from the, um, uh, you know, from the uh, uh, cathedral, or today the cathedral, former the Iglesia Mayor, the main church of Havana back in there. And these are digitized records that can be consulted at the Slave Society's uh, uh, digital archive. Um, so I think that may be my last slide. Um, yeah, so, but, so let me just, uh, let me go back to my little map here, if that's okay. There we go. So what's really interesting, I mean, there's, there's several really interesting things. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up here. I've been trying to keep it under 20 minutes. Molly, please tell me if I'm, uh, if I'm close on time. One minute, 35, 45 seconds. Okay. So there's a lot of interesting things about her story. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's different ways we can talk about it. She's never described as, you know, mulata, yeah, quote unquote mulata, except for this one document, uh, the first one I found, where she describes herself as being mulata in color. And none of the other documents that she or anyone else uh, describe her as, you know, with any racial description. Um, um, so, you know, there's some interesting things we can talk about there. Uh, she's connected, secondly, she's connected to a lot of merchants, mariners, at least one royal official in Havana. Um, so, you know, all of whom have extensive documentary trails. So there's a lot of further uh, yeah, work that can be done with this. Um, most importantly for me, the whole case study is very useful, I think for articulating this sort of interconnected uh, maritime space or spaces uh, that function both within the official imperial Spanish system and outside of right, uh, that system. Um, so, you know, how does our understanding of the, you know, the, Sp the Spanish empire, right? And I use the empire in quotes in my paper because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the way um, uh, things worked at the ground, on the ground level. Um, uh, and so how does our understanding of this imperial framework change? If, if we consider that some merchants operating in Seville, like Catalina de los Santos, were in fact residents of the Caribbean, um, in addition to the privileges that people in the Canary Islands had to be able to trade directly with the Americas for most of the 16th century, 
Um, some of them also had access to the, this crazy travel permit that she had that gave her permission or whoever the bearer of the, of the document was permission to basically go anywhere without, um, uh, uh, without having to get confirmation from the House of Trade in Seville. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of questions basically that this uh, uh, little narrative raises. And I think it, uh, to me, it helps. I don't know that it opens people's eyes to the complexity of the early modern Caribbean, but it's a good, useful um, case study, right? That said, wow, there's so much craziness going on here. And just trying to explain some of it, I think is a really, for me, uh, uh, is starting to prove, and I hope will continue to prove to be a useful exercise um, in getting at some of that complexity, period. Is, is it okay? Yeah, fabulous. Not, not too long. Yeah, no, perfect, perfect. Uh, I have many questions, but I will save them for our discussion and of course defer uh, to everyone attending today who I am sure also has many questions and instead we'll just move directly to our next speaker. Our second speaker is Dr. Justin Roberts, who is Associate Professor of History at Dalhousie University. He's the author of Slavery and the Enlightenment in the British Atlantic, 1750 to 1807, which was published in 2013 by Cambridge University Press. His paper today is titled Mosquitoes and Slaves, Disease, Migration, and Labor in the 17th Century Global Tropic Tropics. Dr. Roberts, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Molly. Um, everyone can hear me, of course. Um, so I, I want to start off by thanking Molly and Carla. I know they started off by thanking us, but I, I can only imagine how difficult it must be to uh, try to organize a conference like this, uh, particularly one that's uh, unseated to the extent that it has been in the last few months. Um, I want to talk today, I, I gave a small sample of a larger project I I've been working on, um, a little tidbit, if you will, and I want to step back and look a little bit at the larger project and some of my thoughts in it. I want to think about the Caribbean in a broad com comparative perspective. So I'm working on a book right now that I'm, I'm hoping will be finished next summer. I managed to squeeze in the last of the research just before the world fell apart. Um, called Chattel Slavery in England's Tropical Empire, and uh, it's from 1650 to 1713. Now, I had been working for a long time on a book on the Barbadian diaspora, and then I became fascinated with slavery writ more broadly across the 17th century globe, um, in part because a student innocently asked me in a class at one point whether or not the East India Company had slaves. I realized I knew nothing about that, and I needed to know. Um, and so when I started doing some more research into this and digging through the, the small amount that had been published on slavery in the East India Company, uh, I realized there were all sorts of overlaps and I want to think about some of these comparisons in the early emergence of English slavery in the colonies um, alongside the, the emergence, if you will, of, of English enslavement in, in the East Indies or in the Indian Ocean. You can see here that uh, in, you know, the, that, that moment that we all know about 1619, Virginia, Virginia in my mind being on the edge of this great circumcurrian world uh, where uh, 20 and odd enslaved Africans are sold. And I thought, well, so much has been debated about that moment and so much has been written in the origins debate. And it struck me that there, there was concurrent events on the opposite side of the globe. And so we see these East India Company captains raiding Portuguese vessels and selling their enslaved people um, obviously, we all know that uh, Dutch enslavement was growing on a massive scale in the 17th century in the East, and the English were trying to emulate that to some extent. So we can see that there's, there's concurrent and developing histories, and it struck me as very odd that we speak about these separately. So I started thinking about where the vast majority of this enslaving seemed to be happening, and it, it struck me that it was all in the 17th century, anyway, it was all throughout this tropical zone. Um, both in the east and the west, and of course on the West African coast, and this is where uh, the English were relying on slaves and where slave majorities were quickly growing. When you look at some of the East India uh, factories or, or what they're calling plantations in the East Indies, there are slave majorities at a number of these places. Now obviously the scale is very different, but they're vastly outnumbering the the few English soldiers and, and, and factors that are traveling there, and of course we know the same thing is emerging in the Caribbean world. And I thought, well, one of the things that's going on, and I'm not the first to notice this, is that the globalization of trade and forced labor markets is creating or spreading diseases throughout this tropical world that um, in the past had been more localized. And these diseases, many of them are mosquito-borne, obviously, in the tropics. Uh, but yellow fever and malaria are, are particularly um, um, becoming increasingly prevalent throughout the 17th century world and they're particularly deadly for Europeans. And it's not just 
malaria, it's a particular kind of malaria. So we know there's four different malarial parasites. Malaria was affecting Europeans in, in the 16th and the 17th century. Obviously, there are outbreaks even in London, but it wasn't falciparum malaria, which is the deadliest form for sure. Um, and so what struck me, and I think the English are observing this as well, is that there's, there's clear and significant differences in resistance or immunity between newcomers to these tropical environments and people who have already experienced many of these diseases. And I'm focusing on yellow fever and malaria, obviously not the only ones, but they're the ones that seem to significantly matter because they, they create these panic pandemic moments in which the English are observing differences between who's dying and who's not. And it's not simply who's dying, it's, it's a decrease in work capacity. So malaria meet, leaves uh, people that suffer uh, from the parasite ill for long periods of time. And that illness becomes increasingly less so, as I understand, with each malarial infection. So what happens is um, that we see a number of Europeans who are not just succumbing to disease, but also um, becoming greatly weakened over long periods of time. And so it struck me that the English are, are using this, and obviously what they're doing is this, this is informing their early racial theories in really unfortunate ways. Um, but it, it's, it's coming from a, a particular differential response to disease that's, that's real. And that explains why, explains in part why so much enslavement is going on throughout the tropics. And the other aspect of that is that there's very few English migrants who are willing to go to the tropical empire there's rapidly rising wages in the metropole. We know there's a decline in the English population between 1650 and 1680. This is when uh, planters in the Caribbean begin to complain that they're not able to bring in as many European servants or white servants. They're saying, well, where are they? Um, and there's more colonial options, obviously, developing in North America. Temperate Jones, we know from um, uh, Kupperman's work long ago that the English have this fear of hot climates. That's been reiterated. And we know that, you know, I've looked at evidence from the East Indies, from the West African coast, and from the, the uh, West Indies, and basically 35 to 80 percent of Europeans are dying in their first year in the tropics. So all of this is creating some, a very particular opinion about who can and can't labor in this tropical world. And so we see these kinds of comments, and this is one that I, I've taken from the East India Company, but there are, there are comparable observations by these English colonial architects all throughout the 17th century world between about 1650 and 1680, increasingly so, they say, well, it's essential to have these enslaved Africans on our um, plantations that we can't thrive. So say, they say, quote, it is utterly impossible for any European plantation to thrive between your tropics. So they're seeing a common tropical world as well. They're, and they're talking about both the Caribbean and the East Indies upon any place without the assistance and, and, and labor of, of you know, what they're calling Negroes. Um, and what's interesting is, is this racial terminology is, is really blurry once we start looking at a global perspective. And so um, that term Negro starts getting used all around the globe. Uh, and there's references in the East Indian Company records to um, people from Indonesia even being, being referred to as Negroes, also coffrees, um, even though that term is generally reserved for the enslaved coming from Madagascar. That's a larger issue, but um, I'll see references regularly to Indian blacks and so on. So this terminology is, is very loosely applied. So what this does is this creates a sort of really interesting crisis for the English political economy because they start relying more on slave labor everywhere they go. And you see, again, comments like this all across the globe, but this is some of the English Caribbean is saying, well, because of this, we don't have enough white men and it's going to leave the few white men in our colonies uh, to be victims of either insurrection internally or foreign invasion. And this is this great fear that you start having. They realize this incredibly lucrative empire they're building is kind of built on a house of cards. Uh, they don't quite know what to do with it. And, and I realized that, so I, what I decided to focus on in this paper is that this is occurring across the globe, but I wanted to focus in particular on the Caribbean and the Spice Islands, because it seemed to me there's striking parallels in a number of ways. And it, it, it most particularly, we have to realize that this is where the English are relying in the Indian Ocean most heavily on enslaved labor. And they're relying on slave labor from the Coromandel coast of India, from the Indonesian islands, um, from Madagascar, uh, and there's even a, a few slaves from West Africa 
um, being used in these, these factories that they're building, particularly in the 1680s. And the English, again, here are modeling themselves in the Dutch, just as I would argue in the New World, the English are modeling themselves on Portuguese success in Brazil, maybe to a lesser extent on the, on the Spanish. The English are always latecomers to the game in, this, in these stories. And so it creates these sort of really interesting common consequences. And, and one of the ones I focus on this paper is debates about whether or not to arm slaves to resist these foreign invasions because the English are in a very fragile state around the tropics. Um, and they increasingly decide in the 1680s and 1690s to consider arming the enslaved. It also produces laws about deficiency in the Caribbean, these deficiency laws being we need uh, this many European servants to this many enslaved people. And these laws start off at ratios of five slaves to one European servant, and they eventually grow in the 18th century ratios of 30 to one because the English are, are greedy and they want to have more slaves and they, they simply can't find enough white servants and migrants to this area. So there's all this efforts at, at deficiency laws and social engineering. You see this in the Indian, Indonesian islands as well. There are not deficiency laws set in place, but there are East Indian Company policies put in place. And we see slave rebellions and maroonage happening across this world. And I've read from so many of the papers in this conference that focus on maroonage. Um, so after I saw these papers, I started thinking about slave rebellions and maroonage in the East India um, Company possessions. And we could see that there's um, a Barbados slave rebellion plot in 1692. I want to think about 1690 as an example here. There's also a slave uprising in Sumatra in 1695. And that's when 23 uh, enslaved people from Madagascar who have just arrived at the English factory escape into the jungle and live in a maroon community in the jungle, killing a couple of soldiers along the way as they escape. And what strikes me is shortly after that, there's a slave rebellion plot in St. Helena in 1695. And as I was reading through the records for that, uh, the East India Company insisted that the, this had started because two sailors had arrived and an enslaved person had overheard the two sailors talking about rebellions that were happening elsewhere in the globe. And they're thinking all about rebellions in the Caribbean as well as rebellions um, in the Indonesian islands. And so I actually think that one of the things that's happening is that the people who had seen the rebellion in Sumatra, uh, these two sailors had arrived in St. Helena, which is a way station. All East Indian Company ships have to stop there. And this rebellion supposedly starts three months after the slave uprising happens in Sumatra. And that's roughly how long it takes for these ships to sail from the Indonesian islands to St. Helena. And so I think what they're doing is they're spreading these rumors and then supposedly inciting uh, rebellious ideas amongst the enslaved in um, uh, uh, St. Helena, although obviously uh, you don't need to recite, incite rebellious ideas. Uh, that's what the English think, but obviously the enslaved would be fought, trying to find ways to resist themselves already. So what I want to stress is that there's these really sort of interesting common interwoven stories. There's these parallel histories going on. The scale is obviously very different um, but there's commonalities that I think we need to pay attention to. I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, our third speaker on this uh, first panel is Dr. Chantel George. Uh, Dr. George is Assistant Professor of History at Marist College. Her current book project is titled Liberated Africans and African Work in Granada. And her second project, on which she will be presenting today, focuses on the kola nut in the Atlantic world. Her paper is titled excuse me, the kola nut in Caribbean history, local and global Caribbean circulations. Dr. George. Thank you. So this project is part of a larger work which aims to foreground the role of Africans in the production, distribution and consumption of kola nut from the 1500s to the 1900s. In um, Africa, the Circum Caribbean, also to Europe and North America. So studies on the life histories of commodities have usually been focused on sugar, tobacco, cocoa, cotton, and they largely focus on the consumption by African labor, driven by changing consumption habits in Europe and North America. But few actually examine Africans as distributors and, and consumers of global quantities across the Atlantic world. And this emission distorts our view 
of the global history of commodities and of the early modern as well as modern world. So most studies on the colonite have focused on its histories within Western Africa where it had various uses um, as a masticatory, a dye form of currency, aphrodisiac, and it was also employed in key life events, political, performance, ritual performance, and in mediating disputes. And Brooks, Lovejoy, Abaka have done extensive work on this. And the early accounts, archival accounts that I found from um, Africa date from about the 14th to 15th century. So we know that it was grown, distributed, consumed initially by Africans. Um, but then in time, the coconut became a really important commodity in North America, where most of us are familiar that it became used for tonics and beverages, um, most popularly, most popular Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, and other consumable products. So some of these studies could say more about cola's relationship between religion, medicine, and identity. And also what's missing from these studies is, as Abaka himself noted, and some attention paid to cola production and its use in Latin America and the Caribbean. And so this paper looks at some initial sources that I found in the archives to work towards an examination of such, that is the role of Africans in the life history or life histories of the cola nut to address these neglected aspects. Particularly, I'm gonna be thinking about the importation of the nut into the region, its naturalization and its use among enslaved and free people, and also the establishment of a trade between various locales of the Circum Caribbean and the Atlantic world. So I believe that the cola allows us to study how Africans have remade their own lives, to use Scott's quote, in the region, not on the periphery, but in the heart of the modern world, the Circum Caribbean. And it also tells us something about how African descended peoples shaped consumption practices locally as well as globally. So the first aspect that I know is the importance of African peoples as agents of dispersal. So the image you see on your screen is taken from the National Archives and dated around 1920s. It um, shows cola nut on, on boats um, coming in support of distribution of crops and other items to and within the Circum Caribbean. Now the cola nut was first introduced to the Circum Caribbean during the era of the slave ship, era of the slave trade. The exact date is unclear, but it was used to quench thirst and improve the taste of water on ships. So I'm presuming quite early on. James McNeish, a health officer in Port Royal, Jamaica in 1880s, hoping to convince commercial parties that cola could take the place or could stand alongside cocoa and chocolate in the global market, examined this new beverage. And he couldn't find any detailed account of its introduction and he con conjectured that it was brought to Jamaica as a sole and valued treasure of a slave. Oral, narrat oral narratives from Brazil by Vokes um, support the introduction of commodities, specifically rice, um, by enslaved peoples, pointing to the role of Africans, including women, as agents of dispersals rather than Europeans. And Rice tells us, and I hope to Cola, the ways in which bonded people conferred meaning to their traumatic experience, remembering the um, the role of rice and other commodities in their survival and resistance. The second thing I want to focus on is how enslaved and free peoples distributed cola within specific territories. So African Jamaicans call the crop bisti and it originates from the Akan word for cola and Niche talks about how this was, how cola was brought and sold within the local Kingston markets. I found an early reference to cola from Hans Sloan, who says the seed was bought on a guinea ship from Africa and planted in a plantation in Jamaica. And it's called Bissi by the Coromanting Negroes and is used for medicinal purposes. So thinking about the markets here 
thinking about Jessica B. Harris's work, how the markets can be understood but beyond their commercial utility as a place where views and information are exchanged to aid the survival of enslaved and also free people. So within the South Atlantic, Afro, free Afro-Brazilians also initiated a trade. And this was between Western Africa and Brazil from the mid 19th century for medicinal liturgical purposes. Even though domestic cola or cola at this time was naturalized, Afro-Brazilians still preferred to export this item from Africa because they believed it um, was special. They believed they conferred extra um, value to this item because it was ex ex imported and it was sought after by enslaved and free Africans. There's a quote from Lagos which demonstrates that cola as well as country cloths were imported to the Brazil, to Brazils, which were used by the descendants of African slaves. The third point I want to talk about is how African descended peoples in the Caribbean also contributed their technical and social knowledge to the production of commodities. As Wood and Carney have shown of rice, the knowledge and expertise, as well as the labour of Africans, were critical in the development of agricultural commodities. So Nish wrote in his, he, um, he wrote in a pamphlet which was published from his lecture that he believed that the enslaved, the elderly enslaved Africans were the first cultivators of the nut and it had been naturalized for a century on the island and he's writing in the late 19th century. Nish inquiries about the plant were directed to African Jamaican peasants as he describes them, who almost alone possess practical knowledge of the nut. The other thing I'm interested in is, and I found some references to this, it's really intriguing, how plantation owners use cola to support the system of slavery. So Abaka notes that the cola nut was sent to Jamaica to prevent thirst and fatigue among enslaved Africans from the 18th century. And I found some references to planters who mentioned that cola was desired um, by them, and that's a direct reference. Um, enslaved Africans from the Gold Coast on Jamaican plantations, according to a Detroit-based druggist, were given cola to avert tax of despondency, to which they believe African descended peoples were particularly liable. And also the druggist mentioned a case, and I'm struggling to find the date on this, for this, um, recorded by a doctor in Jamaica in which cola was used to halt an epidemic of suicide, which threatened to depopulate the estate on which it occurred. I'm interested in how cola was employed by enslaved peoples to mitigate, mitigate the effects of slavery, to survive and resist its effects, um, as seen within the medicinal and liturgical purposes. So during and after enslavement, I'm looking at how African descended peoples were able to shape some aspects of their experiences and cultures through consuming cola. There's an intriguing reference I found from Nisha's work. He observed that the cola nut tree was growing alongside other produce on an abandoned sugar state in the late 19th century Jamaica. Whilst the built structures, the ex-slave cottages and former dwellings were no longer visible, the cocoa palm nuts or cocoa nut palms, the star apple trees, the tambourines, the flora nourished and nurtured by the formerly enslaved Africans had survived. This speaks to the permanence or longevity of African grown crops. I'm also thinking, and I mentioned liturgical use, so how cola was used within specifically Yoruba fun inspired religions such as the Brazilian Candomblé, Cuban Santeria, and tradition that I'm more familiar with, the Grenadian Orisha worship. So cola nut was naturalized in Brazil and Candomblé priests preferred cola exported from Africa to re-Africanize their, tra their traditions. In Cuba, it seems, and Brown talks about this, that Santeria practitioners substituted the nut with coconut shells, demonstrating innovation and selectivity. 
in Grenada, I found an intriguing reference where Kolonat was found on a, on a temple, near a temple, alongside a wooden cross and alongside other paraphernalia. The temple and its surroundings were described as a place of worship for not only the African born, but the Creole and Indian peoples, descended peoples. So a variety of peoples um, acknowledging um, what perhaps could be a single tradition, an Orisha based tradition um, at this site. The last thing, one of the last things I look at is the demand for cola in Western Africa in from Western Africa and also from the Caribbean, but in places such as North America and Europe, particularly from the late 19th century. So Colonel was written about in journals and would appear in numerous herbariums around the Atlantic world. And here are some images of books as well as some of the Colonel samples. Um, so returning to Nish, he mentioned that some of those in the higher classes and it's unclear who he's talking about, but I assume he's talking about Europeans. Living in the country districts were aware of cola's use by the lower classes from newspapers, but also presumably from those around them and began using it as beverages. Niche supposed that cola in this form as a beverage was solely employed by those of the higher classes. However, it's likely that the practice of drinking cola as a beverage was also undertaken by the black population in Jamaica. So evidence is fragmentary, but in the 17th century Sierra Leone, cola nut was added to water to improve its taste. And we have some early, early accounts of Africa, but some also some later accounts in the Circum Caribbean about the use of cola nut as a beverage. So it's likely that the practices of African Jamaicans including the use of cola as a beverage, shaped the consumption practice, practices of the local elite. The Caribbean was also an important exporter of cola. And this is something, this is one of the last points that I focus on. So European and North American drug journals, as I mentioned, published essays on the medicinal benefit of the nut. And it was adopted uh, in the drug and tonic industry. So between 1884, and 1887, Jamaica, for example, exported 2,700 pounds of the nut to the UK and the US. An external trade also developed within the British, French and Spanish Caribbean. And I saw a reference to this and I can't wait to find out more about this circum Caribbean trade within um, the British, um, within the British, French and Spanish Caribbean. The image I have here is of in 1955. So Jamaica, the Windward Islands, Ghana, Nigeria and other British West African territories, Liberia and Algeria were exporting nuts, cola nuts to the United States in the 1950s. These combined exports total just under 1.5 million pounds worth around $86,000 at that time. Interestingly, in that year, Jamaica exported more cola to the US than Western Africa, perhaps due to the proximity of that island to the United States. So that's significant. The Caribbean is significant in the cola nut trade, at least um, in the 20th century. So to sum up, African descended peoples in the Circum Caribbean played an integral role in an agricultural commodity that shaped the early modern and modern world. Within the Circum Caribbean, enslaved and free Africans were central to cola's distribution, production, as well as consumption. And exa examining the cola nut allows us to understand how Africans reshaped their own lives and molded consumption practices in the early modern and modern world. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. George. Um, we will open it up now. I think we will begin by taking some questions from the audience and my own head is full of thoughts. Uh, I have my own questions to pose, but I welcome first uh, all of our panelists to jump in. Uh, and uh, I think Steve has been monitoring the Q&A, so I will let him um, pose the questions to the speakers and we'll go from there. Our speakers did a great job of sticking to time, so we have about a half an hour for questions before our brief coffee break. So my thanks to you all. <laughs> 
Terrific, Molly, and thank you to the speakers for summarising their papers so uh, effectively. Let's start with a question for uh, David. This comes from Joan Flores Villalobos, uh, who's asking, uh, could you perhaps speculate a little bit more about Catalina's self-naming as a mulatta in relation to her social networks in Havana with other free people of colour? Sure, this is... Um Speculate, I think, is the right word, right? Um, because right, there's only so much that um, I'm able to guess at right now. But um, I think it's the main reason. I think, um, um, well, first of all, I think it's interesting that she's able to sort of lose that uh, designation if, if that's what she chose to do. Um, um, but also, it, it, because she has this uh, possible background as a person of African ancestry, right, on one hand, and, and then she's appears later in Havana as um, the godmother or the owner of enslaved Africans who are um, who have uh, godparents uh, who are also enslaved people whose owners are free people of color um, because she because she appears to um, in, in all almost all of the cases she shows up in in Havana um, it's one of the reasons I think she's probably the same person um, I'd like to examine Sacramento records and some other places too um, also, I want to. I also would like to be able to portray her not as a as a bad guy, right, or as a slave owner and an employer of servants and this you know uh, ruthless business person, right. I'd like to be able to portray her as more of a matriarchal uh, type person who's sort of in that time period, right, sort of like a uh, a powerful person with her own retinue who meets social obligations for her depend her dependents, um, including enslaved people and servants, um, you know. And so I think uh, I think. Uh, uh, the social relations we can see through the Sacramento, the, the five Sacramento records in Havana that we have, I think that suggests that she did. Um, I hope that sort of answers partially the uh, question. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to Chantel. So this is a question from Daniela Gutierrez Flores, who really enjoyed your talk and thanks you. Um, but she's wondering how you think your work changes our historical narratives about early modern food culture and food waste. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating question. Thank you. Um, I hoped, I hope that it does that by showing how varied um, foodways were. Um, so at least, so in Europe and North America, it was used for a range of consumable products, not only tonics, but also lozenges, chocolates and wine. And also, I hope to bring the focus on Western Africa. That wasn't the focus of this presentation, but in the larger work to show how it was used for various purposes, greetings, so hospitality, um, for energy, so it was chewed. So just showing those, re those wide uses, but also having the focus on Africa, which seems to be neglected in terms of consumption. So I think that's important. Um, and also noting like the varied uses uh, too um, across the Atlantic world and how that mirrored practices within Africa. I'm thinking more of sociality and I mentioned as a gift and welcoming visitors, but sort of reinserting that focus within early modern foodways. Terrific, thank you. Uh, so Elizabeth Schmidt has a question for Justin. Um, and she's wondering whether there is any evidence of the English looking to their slaves for treatments for the mosquito-borne diseases, or are they largely ignoring those uh, traditions uh, that might actually have helped them in this context? The, the short answer is they're largely ignoring them, but the, the larger answer is I don't think the English actually realize what's going on. Um, <laughs> they, they, just, they just see fever. Uh, and so there's massive fevers. It's, it's pretty clear from the nature of the fevers, the nature of the symptoms that it's um, falsipar malaria, for example, it's ravaging Ben Cool, and then I talk about the paper, uh, and it's it seems pretty clear uh, in the Barbadian context, which I also talk about the paper. That's it's yellow fever, and I'm not the only one to say this. Um, and in the case of Ben Cool, and what's interesting is it settled in the middle of a swamp, uh, so there's mosquitoes everywhere. But again, the English don't seem to connect the mosquitoes to the diseases, w with the possible exception of one East India Company official who says that there's plenty of mosquitoes around and that they always accompany bad air. Um, and so it seems clear to them that mosquitoes and, and, and these miasmas are, uh, have something in common. But they don't know that there's mosquito-borne diseases. 
And no, they're not, um, at least in the East India Company records that I've, I've looked at, they're not looking to what their slaves are doing uh, to keep well or keep healthy. And I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure what the enslaved are doing to keep well or keep healthy. I think part of the reason they're keeping healthy, as I said, is that they, they have this, this um, uh, immunity that they've built up. They've experienced these diseases before. Their bodies have learned, learned to adapt to these diseases. Thank you. Um, coming back to David, question from Robin Darby. Uh, who was very interested in uh, your discussion of early uses of the term Negro. Can you clarify the uses of white slaves, uh, not on the islands, but referring to labor and castle slaves um, in Cape Coast Castle? Sorry, um, white, whites, did I mention white slaves anywhere? Sorry, for David, forgive me. Oh, oh I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, I'm trying to think if we, if I, if I mentioned whites, I might have maybe in the paper. Um, I don't really very. My apologies uh, uh, to uh, Andrew and Robin, but I don't, I don't really follow the question very well. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to read it. I just, I just see the question here on the, on the Q and A page. Um, uses of white slaves on the islands. So perhaps Robin could come back in the Q and A, and we'll take that forward in a moment. I just have a question for Justin. I was very struck by your emphasis throughout, both in the paper and in the presentation, on specifically English presences. Mm -hmm. And I've just been reading Jennifer Wells' astonishing work this week about the significance of the Scots and the Irish being sent to the Caribbean in um, the 1650s in particular. And I wonder how they fit into this particular picture of uh, control of labor uh, that you've uh, elaborated. Yeah, so it's, um, I, I would say that for the period that I'm looking at, it's the English or the colonial architects, it's the, the Scottish and Irish that are getting used as uh, servants of empire, un right. unquestionably. Um, you know, I, I, I have some interesting evidence from the, um, from the Caribbean context where the planters keep insisting they want more and more Scottish servants. They don't want Irish servants. They, after about 1660, they, they, they find the Irish servants not useful uh, a detriment even to plantations. Right. Um, and what they do is they're, they're frustrated the navigation acts are keeping them from, from getting more our, our Scottish servants. And so they're writing to the crown regularly saying, we need to find a way to get more. But this happens uh, in part because um, uh, there are fewer and fewer English servants willing and able to travel because of these sort of declining population numbers and because of rising wages in the metropole just because of other options. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying when I say English. What I should say is people from the British Isles, but obviously what I'm dealing with are English colonial architects for the most part. Right. Let Thank me you. jump in here and ask a question, if I may. Sure. Um, I, I like questions. I'm not sure we can do this on Zoom, but I like questions that get the panelists to talk among themselves a little bit. So I'm going to put something out there to think about how do these papers figure the Caribbean in the conversation? I mean, we, Molly and I called it, what do we call it? Uh, geographies of exchange. Um, but, you know, I can see Justin is, do, is doing a kind of comparative global and Chantel is showing a commodity moving through as a cultural object, et cetera. Um, David has his case study of an individual who's circulating. So could I just get you to talk among yourselves about whether the Caribbean matters at all and how it figures into what you're doing? Shall I, shall I start here? Or Dave, yeah? Go, go, man. Go. Um, you know, it, it strikes me that the Caribbean is the model uh, that the East India Company wants to emulate again and again. Yeah. It's either Caribbean or it's, or it's, it's Dutch Batavia. But the Caribbean is the economic engine of the English Empire in the 17th century. That's very clear. And that's where these vast slave majorities are forming. Um, the East India Company um, uh, sends Caribbean slave laws to St. Helena and says, look, model this model what you're doing on what they're doing in the Caribbean we need to figure out a way. So the Caribbean is, is the driver, it's in the vanguard, it's, it's, uh, um, it's more economically powerful you know, uh, than anything else in the English Empire, it's pretty clear to me. Uh, so that's the heart of my story and then what I do is I carry it out. Chantel, do you want to, I was going to say if I, if I, can I just jump in just like blindly, oh, sure. you know, flailing. I was just going to say as, as I was reading your paper and then listening to your talk, I was, um, 
remembering how some historians of West Africa in the 16th and 17th century, um, I think in particularly of George Brooks, whose, whose older work I like quite a bit, um, he would, you know, and we see other uh, um, references to cola being used as a major trade item, right? People from Sierra Leone taking cola up to like, the, you know, farther up the Upper Guinea coast to trade it for other things. They want to leave there probably with enslaved Africans, um, but cola is one of the goods that they're, so I wonder if Catalina de los Santos, I don't know if she made it that far south, but if she had, you know, cola is, you know, voyages like that between regions, right? Cola was a hugely important commodity in, in the period I'm looking at too. Um, and I wish we knew more about it um, then. I wish I knew more about it then, certainly. Oh, yeah, no, thanks, David. That's, that's really intriguing. I like the idea of following peoples, you know, along with these commodities, um, which, you know, um, individuals such as the person you observed is intriguing to look at but yeah so I think the Caribbean is really important um, to focus on trade from that region but also consumption practices that I you know gets neglected in the study of kola nut um, but also general you know global commodities um, what do enslaved peoples and free peoples do with the kola nut, what does it mean to them, how they use it to survive, how they use it in post-slavery societies for healing, for religion, which I'm intrigued by. Um, and also just thinking about how it was hoped that the kola nut, um, it never did, but would replace um, these larger commodities such as sugar, cocoa, and coffee on those plantations. So kind of the hopes of planters in that region. Just to pick up on that theme, uh, Ramita Ray is asking about the relationship between um, indigenous practice with uh, co uh, cola nuts and later developments. So John Pemberton invents Coca-Cola in the 19th century and he's from Georgia. Yeah. Is he relying on lived knowledge of the cola nut through slave networks in the deep south? Is he familiar with, with its usage? See, this is something that I haven't come across yet. Um, I looked at some of the, um, the archives in Atlanta and I didn't find um, sort of any references to um, Africans in the South, but I think this is a fascinating angle and I'm really interested in exploring that. So there's a couple of questions for David, which both speak to the same theme. So one from Jennifer Morgan and another from Ernesto Mercado Montero. And both of them are asking you to generalize outwards from um, Catalina's case to your understanding of uh, what empire means in this period, and especially for Spanish geographies and circulation of people in the early modern Atlantic world. All right, yeah, thank you all for the questions. Um, also, I can, I'll try to link back to Carla's um, comment earlier about what all this sort of means, right, for the Caribbean, which I've, you know, relentlessly sort of been dodging. Um, but, uh, uh, so uh, for, for the period I'm mainly focusing on, 16th and 17th century, we have these sort of abstract models for the way things worked, you know, including empire. And so, you know, we have a, a port in Europe and then, you know, the main, whatever region we're looking at in the Americas. Um, so, um, so these sort of binary oppositions that, and, and I think Catalina de los Santos, um, her case, is really helpful in showing how inter-regional connections mattered. And the Caribbean is fantastic, uh, historically you're speaking, I mean, in many other ways too, right? If, if, to speak in generality. But the Caribbean is, it's connected to so many other regions that if we start to look at in these inter-regional connections, um, I mean, people, including people like her who move through multiple regions, I think it can help us construct or visualize um, social and economic connections in ways that uh, enable us to move beyond these sort of abstract models that tend to ignore or skip over the Caribbean and its residents. We could say the same thing about the Cape Verde Islands or Sao Tome, you know, as Gabriel's been working on, or, um, uh, you know, or, or, you know, the Canaries, right? Um, and I think what I like about the Catalina de los Santos model is that it enables us to, I hope that it will enable us to sort of prioritize, prioritize the vantage point of uh, people who were not necessarily, um, uh, uh, who are not necessarily house of trade officials or the governor of some settlement or, you know, people who aren't generally represented very well. And, uh, you know, um, even though they were participants, they may not be represented very well in this, in these sort of models. Um, 
I wanted to jump in uh, now that we're sort of moving into big, broad questions, uh, building off of David's answer right now and the questions that were just posed to him. Two big questions I had uh, reading and hearing Dr. George and Dr. Roberts talk, um, particularly for Professor George, I wonder how I think a lot myself about how to periodize the Caribbean and your work is so wide ranging. I wondered if you could talk a bit more about how you think of different uh, periodization approaches to Caribbean history. And for Dr. Roberts, I, um, and you'll, you'll laugh as I pose the question as we both come out of a Hopkins Atlantic background, but I wonder what your new research and your new project has done to your ideas about Atlantic history and its utility as a framing device for how we think about what uh, is happening in the world in the uh, broadly defined early modern period. And of course, I say this as someone who was trained as an Atlanticist myself, but who, because of the way life happens and the stuff that I teach these days, I now um, sort of have a global hat on, uh, you know, frequently. So um, I know those are big questions, but uh, perhaps you could each just wade in and, and share your thoughts. Can you rephrase the question, please? <laughs> yeah, sure. So my, there are two big questions about framing. One is, was particularly sp sparked by, um, by Chantel's work, which is periodization and how we think about the periodization of the Caribbean uh, in our research. Uh, what, is, what is useful? How has our own understanding of useful periods, periodization changed over time? Uh, so that's one question. It can be for all of you. Um, and the other question was prompted by Justin's work, although again, it can be for everybody, which is what does your work, when we, th when we begin to think about global phenomena, global interconnectedness, what does that do to our understanding of the utility of the Atlantic history framework for making sense of the Caribbean in the um, broadly defined early modern period? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here, Molly, if, if you want, uh, because I have an answer for you right away. Two-part answer. One, when it comes to um, the English Caribbean, I, in my mind, I, it's very clearly divided into the pre and post sugar world. Um, when it comes to the English Caribbean, and so I would say that you know that that's important. But it seems to me strikingly that that's that's a way of periodizing global English, the, the history of global English slavery is as well, because the East India Company is paying attention to those to the vast wealth being created in the Caribbean sugar islands. But what I would say about Atlantic history is that I increasingly think of myself as a globalist now. I increasingly um, have come to realize that, that the Atlantic story is limiting. And, it's, and just to give you a, an interesting example of this, um, or a, a way of a story, if I will, about how this has come to be. When I arrived at Dalhousie, there were two courses in place uh, that they wanted me to teach, two, two survey courses. One was the first half of the Atlantic World Survey, and one was the second half of the Atlantic World Survey. They been developed by Jack Crowley, my predecessor. And I've been told many times that Jack increasingly considered himself an early modern world historian when he taught those classes. And I find myself doing the same thing. So last semester, I had long sections on the DOC and the Dutch uh, because I, you can't tell the story anymore without taking a broad global perspective. And I think that's particularly the case in the Iberian context, as you would well know, Molly, from, from talking to John Russell Wood uh, when he was at Hopkins. You know, he used to say to me all the time, there isn't such a thing as Atlantic history when it comes to the Portuguese and when it comes to the Spanish. And I'm really struck by that. And I keep thinking of um, uh, the uh, enslaved person that Ferdinand Magellan took with him on a voyage when he traveled around the globe or tried to travel around the globe and didn't make it. It was an enslaved person named Enrique who was probably the first to circumnavigate the globe because he was an enslaved person from Sumatra who got brought to, to, uh, to, to Europe and sold to Ferdinand Magellan and taken, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there's these really interesting interconnected stories we need to pay much more attention to. Um, and so I, I have a really hard time limiting my focus now. I agree. Just to say um, briefly that, yeah, periodization, I guess, gets blurred when I think about like pre-emancipation and post-slavery just in terms of the uses seems to transcend what happens before and after. Um, and just thinking about the consistency in terms of its uses for religion and survival. So what were free peoples doing following slavery, whether they still needed um, to use the cola um, for various reasons, and I would think that they did. So I guess thinking about the uses might blur the pre and post emancipation periods. Thanks, yeah, I think it raises interesting questions. I mean, when we, all of our papers for this conference um, 
ask us to think hard about what kinds of um, how we mark the passage of time and what we what types of historical records and events we give significance to. And I think it's certainly um, you know political political doorstops, as it were, between eras are in many ways a very obvious and important way of marking time uh, and 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 real pivot points and changes in history and historical practice. But I think that um, with your presentation, I have just and I'll, you know clearly as someone who has also thought about commodity circulation. Um, that uh, those narratives often tell a different story of change and continuity um, mm -hmm. than political ones. So your answer really resonates with me. Thank you. Jump in here really quick because um, some of the panelists seem not able to jump on, some of the presenters seem not able to jump in with the video and the audio. And so Elena has sent a question oh, by the here. chat. She's I there. She was hiding. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, um, and some people are being hidden by Benjamin inadvertently, I think. So, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for these papers. I had a question for Chantel. I put it in the chat, too, if you want to look at it. But um, you mentioned this research bias thus far on the cola nut that has by comparison, neglected Latin America, and yet you also talked about Cuba and Brazil in your presentation. So uh, more of your evidence was from the Anglophone world. Do you think it came to take more importance in the Anglophone world? Um, and then also, I just am, would love to hear you speak a little bit about your research strategies for this really complicated, uh, multilingual, multi-imperial, multinational transatlantic <laughs> research that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lena. Great question. So guilty. And may, <laughs> <laughs> mainly because of my um, limited linguistic skills. So I know that for the project, I will need some fluency in um, Portuguese because Brazil seems to be really significant. And I have to um, do fieldwork there and look at the archives in order to fully understand the colon art. And so this is why I like, you know, the term Circum Caribbean because it doesn't neglect, um, you know, Brazil and other territories. So I just think it's a bias of my training and my PhD work, which was on Grenada. Um, and some of, you know, I looked a little bit about, you know, the other Windward Islands, um, but definitely to move this project forward, I do need to think about um, those other territories and my limited linguistic skills. So we um, sorry, go Oh, ahead. sorry. I, I wanted to jump in here, and I, I guess I'm taking a little bit of Steve's prerogative, but I, I, I already wanted to jump in before I thought that the um, that the um, Q and A was going this way because of what got what was getting said about global versus right, Atlantic. Right. So I just want to say, um, Molly and I have this debate all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Molly is the global person and I am more of an Atlantic person and we actually once wrote a little something just for circulation at an event um, about why that was the case. Um, you know, it's partly that I'm old compared to her <laughs> and when I came up you picked a colony in English North America and that's what you did your research on and you didn't think about anything outside of, of the North American um, East Coast. And so for me, Atlantic was a revelation, whereas for Molly, who's uh, got working in this field much later, and also, I think, quite frankly, was doing Spanish history and therefore is in a context where the Pacific is always part of it, always more broadly geographically focused. Um, so I think it's, I don't think any of those categories are um, hard and fast or that we should, you know, fight for Atlantic over global or whatever. Um, I'm perfectly happy to have us thinking globally in this event and I don't think it diminishes anything from the Atlantic framework, which I picture kind of tucked inside of the global framework. But um, somebody in the Q&A asked a question about how does this play into imperial history? And I actually think Atlantic history, at least in my subfield of it, has been criticized for being too focused on empires. That is, Atlantic history is just, instead of being British North America, is the British Empire in the Atlantic. So, you know, you don't 
going giving up Atlantic doesn't necessarily cause you the problem of of only talking about empires. I think these are complicated and overlaying um, frameworks that make a difference in what you know in what you're doing, regardless of what your particular framework is. So I think that's a very interesting thread that's developing uh, and one we could talk a lot about. But I just wanted to throw that out there as a way to sort of open up this part of the conversation a bit more. So we have another five or six minutes. If there are more questions from the audience, it would be uh, really helpful to hear them or whether any of the panelists want to jump in. David? I'll jump in real quick, just, oh. just to sort of riff on this question of global versus Atlantic. And one of the things I notice when we turn global is that often the questions are helping us explain Europeans um, because you know what what's in common between say Madagascar and the diaspora to the Spice Islands and the West African diaspora to the Americas is of course these English people and the payoff often is how these comparative realms sort of help us see differently the origin of slavery or the understanding of race or, and so it's not that they have to do that, sort of like Carla said, I mean, it depends on what questions you're asking. But I find that so often, particularly in the French Atlantic literature, um, when we go to the comparison with the Indian Ocean world or we, we try to bring it out beyond the Atlantic, it becomes just harder and harder at each remove to engage local histories, especially non-European local histories. Um, obviously, you know, Chantel's work is a good example of where you can have a, a, an African-centered commodity history that goes pretty broad, um, but is not focused necessarily on, you know, European modes of transport or use or whatever. So I'm not saying necessarily is that, but I do think that we have to be a little careful in this, you know, uh, just that there are trade-offs in any framework. Right. And that sometimes if we don't think about what's lost with the turn to global, uh, we might just think that bigger is sort of obviously better. Funny, Britt, hearing you uh, talk on that point, it sounds sort of like the 2020 version of um, what uh, colonial uh, North American historians would have said about Atlantic history. I don't know, in 1995 or something, it sounds um, I, I, I take your points. You're making many valid sort of cautionary remarks, but it also sounds sort of like, I don't know, what are we going to lose if we go big? We're going to lose specificity. Uh, it sounds yeah, I don't mean that it's like uh, I'm worried about it. I'm just saying that I think that it's not often self-conscious in that uh, sort of in the reframing. So for instance, you know, there's just a lot of new, really interesting work on the French Indian Ocean world. And the argument for including it is either we haven't looked at this and it's bigger, or we can understand French conceptions of race or law or slavery more effectively. And so those rationales are perfectly legitimate, you know, uh, payoffs for work. Um, but in each case, it takes us further away from, say, histories on the ground in Senegambia, histories on the ground in the Caribbean, histories on the ground in indigenous North America. And so, um, Anyway, that's, that's kind of where my point of reference is, is much more about the French Atlantic literature. Pablo, did you want to come in? Yes, if I may jump Please. in real quick, because I, 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 and we, don't, we don't have much time, but I, I, I totally agree with what Brett is saying. This is something that, uh, it depends on the kind of question that you're asking, for sure, but obviously the connections that at least we have been hearing and the connections that are usually made under the, the rubric of the global, there are connections that usually go and pass through Europe. This is something that has been uh, uh, particularly prominent in older histories, for instance, of knowledge production, right? Like, and the uh, focus on the circulation of knowledge itself, right? Like, how and, and when is that we're interested in knowledge and what, what are kind of notes through which it passes. So I agree, it doesn't have to be that way, but there is a danger in conceiving in, in such a way that, uh, that you miss some other connections that are possible. But as Brett is saying, that also de-emphasize certain kinds of histories, especially at a time when the global doesn't really exist for many people in, in that space, right? And I, I'm thinking here in the promise of the mother kind of also encroaching in this period, right? That, that is so much demarcated by history that come from the medieval war and the ancient world. 
or is that the, the, the globe is not, doesn't figure here as it figured in the 19th century. So there is also a temporal danger here in trying to impose that sort of teleological kind of understanding of, 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 of the world. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more about this later. Uh, I do have questions for you, Justin, but I will ask them later. Justin? Sorry. You know, I, I think one of the things too that I, I want to stress here is that um, in order to do this kind of global history, at least that I'm doing, in order to ask the kinds of questions I'm asking, I require the, uh, and I, I'm building on, 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 on my predecessors, I require the vast amount of research that's already been done in the Atlantic world. And so you can't really go global until those kinds of local histories have been done and, and done to the extent that they have. And so it's very easy for me because there's been so much written about slavery in the Atlantic world to say, okay, we know this. Now, how can we extend this story? How can we enrich the story by also including this over here? Um, and so I, they're, they're, it's not one or the other, it's that you need one in order to create the other, I think. I think uh, David had something he wanted to say. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just be quick, just to go back to a question that, um, that was asked earlier that I didn't understand the first time, and it really ties in pretty well, I think, with what, um, with what both Brett and, and Pablo were saying, actually, uh, partially, uh, I think, in response to uh, some of the things Justin was also mentioning, too. Um, uh, the idea, so um, Andrew Raptor and Robin Derby uh, mentioned earlier about these very complicated, um, ambiguous sort of racial categories for people working on, um, are being forced to work in uh, Cape Coast Castle. Right off the, you know, on the coast of what's today Ghana, and how some of them were, you know, had sort of were described as white, or they seem to be, um, you know, uh, ambiguous. And they don't conform to the sort of racial, um, you know, expectations that we would have, right, in terms of the way they're described in the sources. Um, which made me think about, you know, you know, some time ago, which makes me think about the fluidity of these sort of racial categories and the problems of projecting much more recent understandings um, onto onto the sort of distant past. Um, without, you know, like a, an awareness of the context, right, the specific context. Um, so for the Atlantic, you know, as opposed to global or Pacific or whatever, I mean, there's some places, some parts of the Caribbean, I mean, I consider uh, much of Panama, right, that we have a, 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 you know, Rob's talk later on is going to, there's some areas of Panama that I think are, you know, they're very much Caribbean, but you have to keep the, uh, you know, what's happening in the Pacific Coast in mind too, right? Um, there's other parts of the Atlantic that, that uh, you know, the connection is it's much more tenuous. It's much harder to sort of uh, build these sort of global, you know, sort of forcing these other, um, you know, you know, contexts uh, in a really, you know, in, in a different space, if that makes sense. So I think um, our conversation is really getting going, but we need to be mindful of people's uh, need for tiny Zoom breaks. So we're going to break here and we have all day to talk. So we will reconvene in 15 minutes. Uh, for session number two. And my thanks to all of the panelists for wonderful papers and for being so considerate of uh, keeping time. Thank you so much and see you all soon. And thank you all for your questions.